Woodrow Durberger uh, became frightened and said, Andrew Cole said to him, do not be frightened. I mean you no harm. He said, uh, I only wish you happiness. I only wish you happiness, what he said. And then he also said, we eat, we bleed just like you do. Uh, and then Andrew Cole, near the end of the conversation, said, at the right and proper time, uh, my appearance to you will be acknowledged in some way. So after this five minute conversation or so, Andrew Cole said to Mr. Durberger, thank you for talking to me. We will see you again. And as soon as Andrew Cole said to Woody Durenberger, we will see you again, the craft came back down, a hatch opened, Andrew Cole walked up to the spaceship, uh, a human arm extended, pulled Andrew Cole up into the UFO, jetted up about again 60 feet in the air, 60, 75 feet in the air, and then made a fluttering sound, made a fluttering sound, and then sped away at a very high rate of speed. Uh, was, when Mr. Durenberger got home, a few minutes after that, um, he was very, very frightened by this. And his wife, he was late, and his wife met him at the door. And uh, later, uh, she described his appearance as he could not have been any whiter if he had been lying in a coffin. That's how frightened he was. She said, what has happened to you? He said, get me a glass of water and I will tell you. He describes to his wife this experience about being stopped by a UFO and uh, uh, being extremely scared. And Mrs. Durenberger goes in and calls the West Virginia State Police and reports the UFO you know, uh, encounter, the close encounter. Uh, word spread after this. Mr. Durenberger uh, tried to go to work the next day. Uh, he wasn't able to do that. He did a live television interview uh, at the local TV station of WTAP in Parkersburg, where he was grilled by um, uh, city policeman Ed Plum, uh, local reporter Glenn Wilson, um, representatives of the state police, the Wood County Airport. And at that time, there was somebody on their way from Wright Patterson Air Force Base to interview Mr. Durenberger. Uh, and after that, his life more or less fell apart. Um, Oh, uh, now during these interviews, these live interviews, I was given these tapes when reporter Glenn Wilson retired, and they are now over in the museum. They are the authentic tapes of Woodrow Durenberger or Gordon Smallwood in the movie uh, being interviewed about being stopped by Andrew Cold. And there's a whole, whole different thing uh, about the men in black and Andrew Cole in relationship to the Mothman and not in relationship to the Mothman. So your question might be, um, why were they included in the Mothman prophecies? And um, even why John Keel did the Mothman prophecies. Uh, John Keel was a freelance uh, writer from New York and I believe he was on his way to do a story, a feature story in Kentucky. And he stopped by Point Pleasant. He realized that the things that were going on here in West Virginia was far more interesting than the story he was gonna go cover in Kentucky. And when he read about, he heard about this uh, man from Parkersburg being stopped by a UFO, uh, by uh, an alien or a creature or a man, a humanoid creature, entirely dressed in dark clothing, he recognized a lot of this story had much in common with things that were going on here in Point Pleasant. And that's why that was put, you know, into the Mothman Prophecies movie. Now, 
there was no Mothman sighting, to my knowledge, you know, to Woodrow Derenberg or any place in Parkersburg, at least back in 1960, 66 there wasn't. Uh, <clears throat> after this, Woodrow Derenberg's life began to fall apart. Uh, if you listen to the interviews, now I do have them, by the way, if anybody's interested, I have them on CD. I only got about four copies, four or five copies, and I'm selling them for $10. One of the more interesting things to me, there's a lot of interesting things. I know that John Keel was skeptical about Woodrow Nuremberg's story. Uh, he thought maybe he might have made this story up. <clears throat> There's some things that leads credibility to it, to me. And one of those are Mrs. Durenberger called the police. Mr. Durenberger did not. He did not seek out publicity, at least not right away. Uh, when I was researching um, this sighting, uh, you know, in the old newspapers, really fascinating, I got a copy, of, and I believe this was, it happened on November 2nd, I believe this was the November 4th edition of the Parkersburg News of 1966. <laughs> and right in the newspaper, you have a story called Local Man Stopped by UFO. Right beside it is an, another article where there was an entire blackout in South Parkersburg at exactly that time, 7.30 in the evening, all of the power went out in South Parkersburg. Well, Mineral Wells is right beside of South Parkersburg. It's very, very close. So there's that element of it too. Um, the other thing that I, I have to consider too, would Mr. Durnberger would almost have to be a prophet to know what was going to happen two weeks later in such a close proximity. Uh, so there's some things that uh, gives credibility to this story. But things got really wild around Parkersburg during that time period of 1966 going back to 1967. Uh, Mr. Durnberger claimed that Andrew Cold would land his spaceship at a place in Wood County called Boca Ridge. And would Mr. Durberger would get up, get on the spacecraft with uh, Andrew Cold, and they'd fly away and visit all these different planets and uh, different galaxies, and it got pretty wild there. Um, I remember listening to the interviews, and y'all, y'all may be interested in listening to them too. Uh, I only found four or five copies before I left this morning, but you know. Partly in the interview, and the interview went on about three or four hours. I had three or four hours of tape, and I think maybe the CDs, maybe an hour. Anyway, so they were long interviews, and very interesting to listen to, and fascinating. But reporter Glenn Wilson said to Woodrow Durnberger, if Andrew Cold said, do not be afraid, we mean you no harm. We only wish you happiness seem very nice and very friendly to you. Why is it, Mr. Durenberger, that you still seem so frightened? And Woodrow Durenberger said, because Cold said to me, we will see you again. And that, Mr. Wilson, is what I am afraid of. So uh, he claimed to be visited by Andrew Cold, his daughter claims to remember visitations from Andrew Cold, as well as the men in black. Uh, Mr. Durenberger's life fragmented. He had several nervous breakdowns. He did not drink or anything like that. He had several nervous breakdowns. At one point, he said he would claim that he was pregnant. Everybody in town was laughing at him. Uh, if you listen to some of these abduction, though, things, the, these claims of uh, pregnancy and, you know, the um, procreative uh, process is not an unusual thing. He would be gone for as much as six months at a time and claim he was with Andrew Cole. I'll tell you what the family told me, um, and they're kind of divided on it, but... Um, 
the family told me they believe the initial report happened, but they believe also that later Woodrow Durenberger embellished some of the story to sell books, which is kind of unfortunate. But he has a book, I mean, I think he self-published it. It was called uh, Manulus, I believe. Manulus was one of them. and. Um, they're available. I don't think they cost a whole lot of money. But I was able to uh, give John Keel the, uh, the uh, CD of the interviews. And he was shocked. He didn't even know uh, his last time here at the festival. Gave him a copy. He said, I did not even know these existed. And I think he was skeptical that whether they were real or not. But they're definitely real. Just fascinating. So I have copies of those for anybody interested. So this takes me to... Uh, the other, the other part of the story that I'm very familiar with, and that is the, um, the sighting from Doddridge County of Merle Partridge, Bandit, the German Shepherd Dog, and the Red Eyes in the Barn. Okay, I get a drink here. Uh, Mr. Partridge is here probably about 10 years ago. It might have been it's 15 years, I guess, the festival, right? It might have been as much as 12 years ago. It was quite a while ago. But uh, so I interviewed, I interviewed him again. I knew his children. I sat in class with the Partridge children, okay. including the little boy that went out to the barn. So um, in John Kill's book, he's called Noel Partridge. I asked him about that. He said, I don't know how that happened. Uh, he said, uh, "My name, uh, you know, his name was never Noel, but it's Noel in the Mothman Prophecies book. But his actual name was Merle Partridge. Um, it was about 10:30 at night. I think it was November 15th. Same as the the date is kind of sketchy when you read the different reports. Some articles say 13th, some say 14th, some say 15th. But it was the same night of the Scarberry sighting, according to him." Okay, November 15, 1966, 10.30 at night. There's different accounts, uh, but most of them believe it's the same night as the Scarberry sighting. That Merle Partridge and his young son, Roger, were watching television about 10.30 at night when the television set began to make a strange groaning, grinding like a generator, he said, whining like sound. And then the picture blanked out. And that is when they began to hear their 75 pound German Shepherd dog named Bandit began to bark in a very unnerving, atypical kind of way that was just different. It was, they could just tell by the way the dog was barking, it was just something different. So, uh, Mr. Partridge and uh, Roger went out uh, looking for Bandit, and about a football field away at what was the hay barn, they saw Bandit at the entrance of the barn barking and barking and barking and barking. So Mr. Partridge and his son Roger go up to the entrance of the barn and they look inside and that is with what Mr. Partridge sees, what he describes, once again I told you earlier, something that looked like red rotating electrical lights. That those are his exact words, okay? His exact words. He said, as a matter of fact, right here in Point Pleasant, he said to me, he said, then he said, those red eyes, those red lights, whatever you want to call them, that's what he said to me. So when they're, they're looking at these red eyes or lights, a, a paralysis sort of sweeps over them and they can't really move. And that's when the fur on Bandit's back stands up, the dog snarls, runs into the barn, and something starts to lumber up from the floor. 
something huge and dark lumbers up from the floor. Mr. Partridge and Roger are able to come to their senses or get a hold of themselves. They run back into the house. And they sit down in front of the television set. The dog stops barking. The picture comes back on the TV set. Mr. Partridge goes to bed. They go to bed. It's about midnight by this time. They go to bed. And Mr. Partridge sleeps with his rifle beside of him that night. The next morning, Bandit did not get up, um, did not come uh, to the back porch or the back uh, stoop for his uh, morning breakfast like he always did. The dog was missing. So at this point, Merle Partridge, Gary Partridge, Mary Partridge, and Roger Partridge, these are the children, remember the last place they saw the bandit was in the barn. So they go up to the barn and they go inside to investigate. They don't find anything but bandits' paw prints. And the paw prints are going around and around in a circle as if the dog has been chasing its tail. The paw prints do not lead away as if that dog's been lifted up and carried away by something much larger and something much stronger. The dog never came home. They never saw the dog again. Now, Mary Partridge, who would have been maybe 11 at that time, um, she said they saw these huge prints in the mud floor of the barn that looked like enormous turkey tracks. She said that's what it looked like to her. And she was looking at the statue out here, and she said the feet on that statue were nowhere near as big as those tracks that they found in the mud floor of the barn. Well, how did this story, because uh, Center Point and Point Pleasant, they're like 100 miles away from each other. You know, back at that time, that would have been two and a half hour drive, I would imagine, because there, we didn't have the four lane at that time. So, uh, Mr. Partridge was reading a newspaper account about how on that same night when Roger and Linda Scarberry were coming down Route 2, chased by the Mothman, they go by the city limits sign of Point Pleasant. Linda Scarberry looks over and beside the city limits sign she sees the dead body of a German Shepherd dog. So Mr. Partridge then sees these accounts of these red eyes, and then he reads about this, this dog, you know, uh, dead dog um, that the Scarberry saw. The very, that, this was two hours later uh, that the Scarberry saw the dog and had the moth inside. And so he put two and two together and thought maybe these stories were connected. And I believe he called a, he may have called a newspaper. I'm sure he didn't call John Keel, but I think he called a newspaper to give his report. Uh, Mr. Partridge and Woodrow Durenberger have some things in common. Um, after these initial, I would call them contacts and visitations, their lives begin to unravel uh, in strange sorts of ways. Um, you know, I talked earlier about Woodrow Durenberger, his nervous breakdown, uh, him believing he was traveling with the aliens, him coming up missing, his marriage ended. Uh, the family was just laughed out of Parkersburg, basically. They ended up moving to Cleveland. Now, Mr. Durenberger came back in the early 1990s he died about 1994, 1995, and he is buried at Mineral Wells. Woodrow Durenberger is buried. Uh, so his life completely unraveled. He completely lost his reputation. People made fun of him forever. Uh, Merle Partridge, uh, kind of similar. Merle Partridge has a really interesting story to tell me. And that was spring following... Um, 
bandit coming up missing, and of course the Scarberry sighting along with you know, dozens if not a hundred other sightings here in West Virginia and Ohio. Uh, he was lying outside on his deck one afternoon, I think it was in the spring, 1967, and he looked up and he saw this enormous spacecraft going over top of him. And he described it in a very similar way that Woodrow Durber did. He described it as a dark charcoal gray. He said it was completely silent, but he said this one was enormous. He said it was absolutely enormous. It was blacked out the sky. So he had this particular experience, and I've got another one that's fascinating, but there's, another, there's several. Uh, later, he became a truck driver, and um, this probably would have been within a couple of years. He was a truck driver, and he was driving home late one night, and he got very tired. He decided to sleep in the, you know, in the cab of his truck. And when he woke up early in the morning, he was completely covered from head to foot in cobwebs all over his body. Now, one of the more interesting stories he told me has never been published. And so I'll tell that to you right now. It's never been on any TV shows and never been published. Uh, the spring following the red eyes of the barn and Bandit coming up missing. He heard a knock on his door about 10 o'clock at night. He opened his door, and <clears throat> this was a, this was the country, is a country town. And there's a man there, a middle-aged man, about 40 years old. He said, listen, he said, I, I run my Jeep into a ditch. He said, and I can't get out. But he said, that's not what I'm worried about. He said, I can't find my six-year-old son. He is missing. He was right in the seat beside of me. Now this man said as he was driving down this country road in center point, as he was driving down the road, this huge like wing came over the windshield of his car. A wing came over the windshield of his car. And he couldn't see. So he ran his Jeep into a ditch and then whatever it was, fled. He didn't see anything else but like a dark wing over the windshield of his car. So he runs into a ditch and he looks over and his child is missing. So the closest house was Merle Partridge's house. So Merle Partridge <coughs> got his flashlight and went out looking for the little boy. They did not find him. They went back to the house. They called the police in Salem and the police from Clarksburg and called the police to help come look for this little missing boy. Finally, the police get there within the hour and they begin the search for this child. Up the road, in the opposite direction, comes this little boy, as if he's sleepwalking. He seems to be like in a daze. He's just in a daze walking down this country road. And they go and, you know, they go and get him. And he can't remember where he's been for that hour, <clears throat> hour, hour and a half, however long it was. He couldn't remember it. Had no memory of where he'd been for that hour or two. So, you know, that story was put to rest among the many strange things. You know, like I said, Durnberger and Partridge, both their lives went into strangeness after those two en encounters. Uh, Mr. Partridge said a few years ago, he got another knock on his door. There was another guy about 40 years old. He said, you know, you don't remember me. He said, I'm that little boy that was lost that night. He said, and still, I do not remember anything that happened to me in that hour to two hours that I was missing. I have no memory of it. So, <clears throat> those might be, um, different takes on the Mothman. I've got another story that was given to me on the ghost tour. It was a young woman who was a teenager back in 1987. And um, she never heard of the Mothman. 
Uh, she was born after the Mothman, and she came from a family that wouldn't likely talk about things like Mothman, you know. So she was up on Quincy Hill in Parkersburg with her boyfriend, and uh, they got up to the top of Quincy Hill. That's one of the highest hills in Parkersburg. You can see the Ohio River from Quincy Hill in downtown Parkersburg. They are going up Quincy Hill, similar to um, the man with the Jeep. This wing sort of goes over the windshield of the car and is withdrawn back. And she said, they saw this thing. Really, she said, it looked like a huge insect. She said the knees were on backwards. You know, the knees were not like a person. They were, the knees were like the knees of an insect. They were backwards, you know, facing the other way. And she said, as it crossed the street, Quincy Street, Quincy Hill, she said it, it was as if it wasn't used to walking on its feet. It had a very awkward gait. That got my attention. She saw no red eyes, you know, nothing, no red eyes, um, because the thing was facing in the other direction, but it had an insect-like appearance and it had huge wings. She was scared to death, went home that night, told her parents, and they said, that sounds like kind of a description of the Mothman. You know, so take it or leave it. Um, but what got my attention about <clears throat> that particular story um, was she didn't really study up on the Mothman, and many of the witnesses that saw the Mothman said he had a shuffling gait, and it was very awkward, like he wasn't used to walking on his feet. Um, so, with these tales, they remain a mystery. But I can tell you, with the Point Pleasant witnesses, uh, the one, some of the witnesses that I've known, <coughs> very credible people that would have no, no reason to bring this kind of ridicule upon themselves at all. Uh, so something happened, um, and those are my stories. And I, if I have any, if you have any questions, I might be able to answer those because I've got lots of information. So anybody have a question at all? Question, question. No questions. There's a lot. I'll leave you. Yes. Bandit. Well, you know, I, I was looking that up again. Uh, the exact date is kind of sketchy for the partridge sighting. It's usually in agreement, but the way it seems to work out, you know, it is um, it was between 10 and 10:30. The partridge siding with bandit and then out here with the roger and linda scarberry it was only an hour later an hour and an hour and a half later um so i don't know how the how the, how the crow flies uh how far i think it's about 90 miles between center point point pleasant about 90 miles as the crow flies maybe more than that if you drove it so same night within the hour um, they, they included that particular story at one time on the X-Files. That's, I think that's the only thing that's ever covered it was mentioned. Any other questions? I've got more Mothman info. You just have to dredge it up here. Um, anybody ever, oh, go ahead. Well, I, you know, that is very difficult says, I saw the Mothman, you know. Um, it's kind of like when a person would say, I saw a ghost and it was all see-through, I could see through it. That's not how ghosts appear. Usually when they appear, they appear as very solid. But when I, the only, the 1987 when I talk about, because the girl hadn't really wasn't even the end of the moth, man. It was just a shocking thing. In the 19, late 1980s, they had a creature they called the Owl Man in England. And I, since then, I think I was, there was something. Does anybody know when there one recently? I didn't even read up on it. Like real recently, like in the last few months, he was sighted somewhere. <coughs> he 
Anybody know anything about that? I always like to look into those. But you know, uh, probably if you go out here to the TNT plant and you go out looking for the Mothman, kind of like it is with ghosts, you go looking, you're not likely going to find them. Uh, not in any big dramatic way because these encounters come quite unexpectedly. There's some unexpectedness about these encounters. And uh, that, that doesn't mean we shouldn't still study them and try to find out what they mean, though. Any other questions? I got more info. Uh, Linda Scarberry, one thing I forgot to tell about that particular one, I left that out. I don't tell that one, but I'm sure you're all familiar with the Roger and Linda Scarberry. Uh, she too, uh, when they were coming down Route 2, uh, trying, trying to uh, outrace the Mothman, that's when they had billboards along the side of the road and she glanced over and saw what she thought were two red lights. And it was a billboard. When the billboard was caught in the lights of their car, she could see the Mothman perched on that billboard. And those red electrical lights, she realized was his eyes. And as they pass the billboard, the Mothman takes flight and begins to chase them again. Now as we're coming down the hi highway, the Mothman's wings are so huge, he's flapping his wings. And it's, the wings are actually beating on the side doors of the car. And when they when the Scarberries drive to the Point Pleasant uh, police station, and Linda makes her famous drawing of the Mothman, the police go outside and they uh, they look at the car, they search the car, they look at the car, and there are scratches on the door of Roger Scarberry's car. And he was the kind of person, he would definitely notice if there had been scratches there before, long scratches. And it seems like where those wings were beating. Many mysteries about this. Any other questions? Yes. It's possible. I can't speculate anything. <laughs> I mean, even our spaceship UFOs, are they projections of something else? You know, are the, do they actually come from other planets? <clears throat> Are they just projections from some other dimension? I think there's a lot of things that points probably more to them coming from other dimensions than outer space. So I don't have those answers. <laughs> Rosemary's going to talk about that though. Um, anything else? Yes. What was that? <laughs> Yes, it is. Oh, I could find out. I don't know. He's buried. If you go out where the cracker barrel is, you turn off the mineral wells. I, Rosemary and I, we found his grave one day. Uh, you go toward the road. Um, I can't know the route number, but you just go toward Elizabeth, I think, or head toward Elizabeth. I think it's that first graveyard and church you see on the right. He's buried right there. But I could find out if you want to email me. I don't know. But yeah, the house is still there. Anything else? Fascinating story. Um, I don't have time to go into it today. I think I'd probably have time for my talk to be over. But my uncle worked at Wright Patterson Air Force Base around the same time. <coughs> Had, had an encounter almost identical to Woodrow Durmer, except he was out coon hunting. And it was the same thing. Stopped by a UFO, ordinary looking man, 35 years old, I want to see you again. It was almost identical. And uh, it changed him as well. I also think uh, these experiences happen in families. Uh, families attract these kind of experiences. They tend to happen in families as well. Okay, any, anything else? Also, another interesting thing I'll throw out for you, which goes back a little bit 
to Chief Cornstalk's curse, and that is the number of these witnesses having Native American ancestry, which I do. I'm Delaware, Shawnee, and then Woodrow Durenberger was Black Dutch in West Virginia. That means you're part Shawnee and then. Um, the Partridges were part Blackfoot, so Pony in the end. So there's, there's that angle to it that's real interesting too. That so many of these witnesses have some kind of Native American ancestry. It might tie into Cornstalk's curse. Okay, what else? Yes. That's what I thought. I saw something. I tend to be, I, I'm kind of bad. I, it's, it's like when somebody calls me up with a, a I hate to admit this. It, it, usually when people, someone calls me up with a ghost story, I, I really, I'm usually skeptical. I think, oh, what have they watched on TV this time? You know, that sort of thing. You know, the, you know, a lot of times it's that. So um, I haven't looked into that, but I need to do that. All right, looks like Rosemary's here. So thank you all very much.